Hey there, freedom lovers. Welcome to the Freedom Media Network. I am your host, Kurt Mercadante. So grateful you are here. And if you are a first time listener or viewer, welcome. If you're a return listener or viewer, welcome back. As you know, we have wonderful guests on a variety of topics here on the Freedom Media Network. I like to call it holistic freedom, whether it's your business, freedom of thought, spiritual freedom, and health freedom, which mm. we're going to talk about today. Although I think our guest today might say the microbiome affects all of the above. Our guest today is Spencer Feldman. He's the founder and CEO of Remedy Link. He's a multiple patent holder, holder and has been designing and manufacturing detoxification products for over 20 years. His groundbreaking work creating detox repositories spawned an entire industry in the alternative health world. And today we're going to talk about the microbiome, something you may have heard about, something you know no, perhaps know nothing about. Spencer, welcome so much to the Freedom Media Network. Well, thanks for having me, Kurt. You know, yeah. it's, it's interesting that there is a lot of overlap between the people that are interested in freedom and sovereignty and, you know, autonomy and people that want to improve their health. And uh, because one of the things you do when you start becoming personally responsible for your life is mm -hmm. you also become responsible for your health. You realize that the establishment, um, you know, it's really great for a gunshot wound or, you know, a, a car crash, but for the kind of day-to-day -day chronic things, they're not that helpful for us. And so then you have to go and figure that out for yourself. And then, of course, you know, what's the point of, of having all the freedom uh, mentally and financially and the ability to travel if you don't have a body that, you know, allows you to have those, to enjoy those freedoms? So, yeah, I think, um, I think they're a good pairing. Yeah. And, you know, I've had uh, gut issues for about, well, for probably over 20 years and probably before that didn't even know it. Uh, some of it I probably destroyed from eating two and a half pound burritos in college and washing it down with beer. Um, <laughs> but I made some changes about 12 years ago, but still it, it's been off and on. But I noticed that when my gut is off, it's as if you hit a switch and everything goes mentally, physically, spiritually. Mm -hmm. I go into a different place where I just feel like I spiral out of control. And mm -hmm. I remember that back in the nineties. Mm -hmm. And, um, so the microbiome, a lot of people hear the gut and they just refer to the gut and they say, mm -hmm. well, it's your second brain. I've heard some people actually say it might be your first brain. Well, what's the important, well, can, can you, for those who aren't really familiar with it, can you give a brief overview of what the heck is the microbiome? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, if I ask someone to draw a tree, they, you know, draw the trunk and the branches and the leaves, but that's half the tree. The other half of the tree is underground with the roots and the bacteria living on the roots. And because we don't see it, we don't really think of that as the tree. But a good orchardist, if he sees a tree that's suffering with like leaves that are wilting or being parasitized, they'll think, well, what, what do I need to do to support the roots of the tree? You know, what nutrients and what's going on so that the tree can be healthy again? It doesn't go after the leaf. Well, the microbiome is like the roots of our tree. It's the roots of our metabolic tree. It's the other half of us we don't see. And you know, someone, you know, when I first started studying the microbiome, I thought, okay, if it's out, maybe you get a little gas or maybe, you know, you have a little upset stomach and can't eat certain foods. It's so much more than that. Uh, so what I want to talk about is what the microbiome is, what it does for us, you know, how we get it, how we lose it, because most of us have lost it, and then how we get it back again. So, uh, you know, what does the microbiome do? It, yes, it controls digestion, but it also makes all your vitamin. It makes vitamins. It breaks down toxins, and it manages the homeostasis of every system in your body. So, in terms of the immune system, the microbiome has more cells, uh, immune cells, than in your bloodstream and your bone marrow. In terms of hormones, the microbiome has more endocrine cells than all the endocrine glands of the body combined. In terms of information processing, it's almost three times heavier than your brain. And in terms of a genetic database, it's got a thousand times more genetic information than your DNA. So it's running the entire show. It's, it's regulating neurotransmitters, hormones, blood sugar, everything. It's running the whole show behind the scenes, right? It's sort of like, you know, you go to watch, you watch a, a Broadway play and yeah, you see the few actors, you don't see the enormous support going on behind the scenes, changing scenes, doing all that kind of stuff. This is the behind the scenes stuff that runs your whole body. And if you want to have good health, you have to have a healthy microbiome. There's no way around it. So, you know, a question is, well, all right, let's go to the beginning. Where did we get it? So based on archaeological studies, 
you know, for about 800,000 years, primitive man and our early ancestors were eating a diet mostly of tubers, insects, fruit, seafood, wild game, nuts, seaweed, honey, those kind of things. And all of these foods have uh, specific sugars called oligosaccharides, which people probably haven't heard of, so I'll explain what they are. There's roughly three classes of sugars. There's the simple sugars like you find in fruit, uh, and you digest those pretty quickly. They go right in. And then there's the complex sugars uh, like carbohydrates, like starches in rice and beans. And you can digest those, but they take some enzymes, and it goes a little slower. But then there's these middle-sized sugars in between the two, um, and they're called oligosaccharides. And we can't digest them, but they're in the food. Now, wherever there's food, something will come along to eat. That's sort of like a rule of nature. So, you know, we're eating food that has these things we can't digest, and we're eating bacteria because it's in the food, the water, and the soil. And then the bacteria gets in and it colonizes our gut and starts eating the things that we can't. And like any um, life form that we live with long enough, it becomes symbiotic with us, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the microbiome is this collection of mostly bacteria and also particular viruses called bacteriophages that live in our gut. And they want us to be healthy and live a long time and reproduce well because they've got it good. They've got this place that's dark and moist and low oxygen and a constant source of food. So they're psyched to be there. And so they want to support us because the healthier we are, the longer they've got that place to be. And so over hundreds of thousands, over millions of years, they have learned all these ways to improve our health, right? They make us stronger. They make us smarter. They help us fight infections better. They make us age slower. In other words, the microbiome was and still is today the most powerful human upgrade you're ever going to have. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, you, you, for some, for some people who might be not aware, it might not be aware, but it's something I've learned about over the last, you know, 12 years. You, the first thing you mentioned, the first type of tube was tubers. Hmm. Can you explain what those are? <laughs> sure, sure. So, you know, there's, there, you know, when we eat vegetables, there's the fruit, there's the leaves. Um, in some cases, people eat different parts of them, the flowers sometimes. And then there's things that grow under the ground. And then there's the roots, like carrot, right? A carrot root. And then there's tubers, which are these things that grow underground that aren't the roots, but they're like a storage place for the plant to hold fuel for later. Mm -hmm. And so like a Jerusalem artichoke is a tuber, as an example. Got it. Got it. So one of the things, and when we spoke offline, we talked about, you know, I was paleo. Mm -hmm. And then primal and then a, and a bit carnivore, which for a variety of reasons got better, but not fully better. Mm. Um, looking at that, at what true paleo perhaps was, and, and, and you kind of educated me on what it might have been versus, you know, what, what people talk about it being. What did those people at the beginning, at the, at the beginning, right before the, the agricultural revolution or right at it, have incredible microbiomes? Uh, they and did. Still, where do we go wrong? <laughs> yeah, they did. And, you know, if you study um, some of the primitive tribes that still are around, uh, the most studied would be the, uh, uh, the Hadza, the Tanzania. Um, yes, their microbiomes are quite different and much more robust than ours are. Uh, and we'll get into diet in a little bit. And we can, we can talk about, um, you know, if someone's going to be carnivore, how can they do it in a way that they don't have some long-term troubles uh, by not feeding the microbiome properly. But let's talk a little bit more about what it does, how we get it, how we lose it, and then we can kind of come around and talk about some of the diet part. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, in the last trimester of pregnancy, progesterone in the mother stimulates a bloom of bifidobacteria in her microbiome. So basically, and that's the bacteria for babies. So her mm -hmm. microbiome shifts to a baby state so that she can then pass it on to her child. And when... During childbirth, as you know, the head descends as long as it's a normal face down delivery and not cesarean or sunny side up or premature, the baby's going to get some of the microbiome, um, both from the mother's microbiome and then from the birthing canal. So it's going to, she's, the baby's going to get bifidus from the, from the, uh, the microbiome and lactobacillus from the birthing canal. And then from there, the mother's going to create some 200 different oligosaccharides. Remember those special sugars we can't digest in the breast milk, more oligosaccharides by weight than protein. So as far as nature is concerned, it's more important to grow the microbiome in the baby than to grow the baby. That's how important mm -hmm. nature thinks the microbiome is. So what does it tell us? It tells us our microbiome needs both a large quantity and a large variety of oligosaccharides. 
<clears throat> so then the child starts eating food, solid food, by like two and a half, <clears throat> excuse me. And then at that point in time, the microbiome shifts to that of an adult because they're eating solids. And we go from the, lac the bacillus and lacto um, the bifidus and lactobacillus over to like the firmicutes and bacteroides. And uh, so what that tells you is you control the makeup of the microbiome by controlling the oligosaccharides you feed it. If you want to shift what's in your gut, shift what you're feeding it. Hmm. And what I've identified are like four initiations of the microbiome. So these are four things that they put our body, that kind of do for us, rites of passage, right? Uh, so let's go over, the, there's probably more, obviously, but let me go over four, like four of them. So the first initiation happens when we're inside the womb and met metabolites produced by the mother's microbiome pass through the placenta and guide and manage the growth of the developing fetal brain, making us smarter. So part of our intelligence is due to the microbiome of the mother. Hmm. The second initiation happens when IgA, which is an immunoglobulin, especially in colostrum from the breast milk, it goes and it teaches tolerance to the immune system. Basically getting IgA at the same time as the mother's microbiome into the baby as it's establishing itself, teaches the baby's immune system that the microbiome is self. Don't attack the microbiome, it's your friend. Third initiation, the microbiome continues to guide the brain development after we're born. We're not born like, you know, um, certain four-legged animals that can walk as soon as they hit, the, you know, out of the womb. You know, we're completely um, dependent and, un and unfinished, right? Because um, our head could only get so big before the woman's pelvis cracked. So we have to finish our brain development on the outside. And part of that is the myelination of the nerves and so forth. So we continue our brain development outside of the womb. And, you know, this myelination is, is uh, um, the, the microbiome is completing the myelination of the nerves and stimulating uh, continued growth of the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for cognitive behavior like uh, personality expression, decision making, social behavior, and in the hippocampus, which is memory. Mm -hmm. So now it's making your brain human before and after birth. And then the fourth initiation is it teaches the immune system what is other, right? First it said, this is self, don't attack this. Now it's saying, this is other, this is threat, attack that. Now people that have autoimmune issues, they have immune systems that don't know what self is and they attack their own bodies. And I'll mm -hmm. explain why that happens in a bit. And then people with weak immunity, they have immune systems that don't know what other is and they don't attack infections properly. So you need a healthy microbiome to know the difference between self and other and to have an effective immune system. And I'll, and I'll give you an example of parasites. Uh, and don't think of parasites just as worms and helmets. You know, a lot, most of them are just round little dots. So parasites are an ancient adversary. And while the mammalian immune system is about 200 million years old, parasites have been infecting us and our pre-mammalian ancestors for over 500 million years. And in that immense time frame, they've learned a lot of strategies to evade, suppress, attack, and distract our immune system. Uh, so, but their greatest trick is that they can vary their surface protein. So our immune system doesn't recognize them. So as an example, Lyme disease, right? A lot of people have it and aren't sick with it. And then some people who get it, get ruined by it. It's because their immune system can't see it. They can't fight it. And as an example, so you've got a, you've got a parasite that's in the person and it's got a, a red coat and a blue hat. And then the immune system finally goes, oh, red coat, blue hat, bad news. Let's kill it. And it knocks out all the red coat, blue hats. But then the parasite goes, well, all right, let me change. And now I've got a, a green pullover and an orange scarf. And the immune system's like, I haven't seen you before. And then it has to figure it out all over again, right? Now, T. brucei, which is the parasite that causes sleeping sickness in Africa, has over 2,000 genes to code for the proteins on its surface. It's got 2,000 different changes of disguise, right? These, so parasites are the masters of disguise. And you know, as soon as the immune system learns how to recognize them, they change to another form and makes them invisible again. And the wear and tear on the immune system and the metabolic cost of not only having the infection, but constantly having to up change and learn and over and over up. And, and you get these people who will have these waves of infection where they get better because their immune system finds it. And then they get worse as it changes and then back and forth. And eventually the parasite wins because the immune system is just, it's just exhausted from this metabolic act activity all the time. Now, some parasites create lipopolysaccharide coats that are almost identical to human tissue. It takes a very finely tuned immune system to deal with parasites. If the immune system is too aggressive, it attacks, the, uh, it attacks the parasites, but it also attacks the tissue the parasites mimicking, that's autoimmune. And if it isn't aggressive enough, it leaves the parasite alone to replicate. Now, another trick, as if they didn't have enough, is they, use, uh, they trigger the good bacteria in the microbiome to become predatory and attack us. 
the way the immune system, this way the immune system gets distracted and overwhelmed with rogue bacteria. So they don't have the, the resources to deal with parasites can barely see anyway. It's like if you were trying to rob a bank and you called in, you know, and you, you had some of your friends go to the other side of town and, and, and create a little riot. So all the cops went there. Well, now the bank's wide open for you, right? That's, that's, that's their oh, game. Wow. They're smart. Now, parasites may be 500 million years old and they have a lot of tricks up their sleeve, but the bacteria in our microbiome are three and a half billion years old. Kurt, they've seen every trick in the book. Parasites are no match for a healthy microbiome, but most of us don't have a healthy microbiome. So then the question said then is why, you know, why don't we have a good microbiome and how do we lose it? And how do we get it back? It's, um, when you talk about parasites, <clears throat> I've read these stories about people going to their doctor mm. and these doctors say, no, you don't have one. They won't test them or they just, they act like it's some sort of conspiracy theory that you have a parasite. Why is that? So a lot of doctors have fallen into this idea of delusional parasitosis. And this is a, a, a modern day version of um, hysteria. Okay. So uh, a hundred for, for hundreds of years, when a woman had PMS, they said, Oh, you're hysterical. Well, hester means womb. So yes, she is having a, an issue with her womb from what they could understand, right? And what they didn't understand was it was hormonal and they needed some help, maybe detoxing a little extra, uh, some, of, some of the, the hormones because probably their microbiome was off. But hysterical became a term to call for, that we called women, that doctors would call women when they're just saying, oh, they're, they're just being um, unreasonable because they didn't understand that what hormones were. They didn't understand that they were getting thrown out of balance and it was messing with their minds a little bit. Right. So now there's the new version of hysterical, which is delusional parasitosis. Oh, you don't have parasites. You've been watching too many YouTube videos. You're not in the third world. How could you possibly have a parasite? You just think you have a parasite and here's an anti-anxiety med for you. So it's just, you know, a lack of understanding of what parasites are, um, that they are in first world countries and what kind of problems they cause. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it's. Uh... I've read some horror stories and people have gone, you know, alternative, what, what, what is called alternative medicine to find it and they deal with it. And, it, mm -hmm. and it's, but I guess that could be applied to many things with Western medicine today. <laughs> uh, yeah. You just have to know what they're good for. Right. You know, I don't want to go to um, an alternative medical doctor uh, with a gunshot wound, but I also don't want to go to a hospital with like Lyme disease. So, you know, I, I have a great respect for emergency room medicine and I have a great respect for the amazing diagnostic technologies that modern medicine has in terms of chronic disease. Uh, I don't think that they really have their, their game on that yet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so you were going to go into kind of, how did we lose it? Right. How do we destroy this right. microbiome? <laughs> okay. So, um, right. So, you know, a uh, bad childbirth sequence or lack of breastfeeding will do it. Um, and then there's three stresses we, the microbiome can face as we get older, three classes we'll go through. The first is we don't eat primitive diets, you know, um, and, you know, who would want to be chewing on insects and tubers all day long? Um, so we're not giving them the sugars they need to feed, all right? Uh, the second is chronic exposure to toxins like glyphosates, which ruin the gut. Uh, artificial sugars, which the gut thinks is food and it ruins them. Certain pharmaceuticals or all the hormones, they are all very damaging to the microbiome. And then you got things like uh, antibiotics, like Cipro, right, which can wipe out 50 plus percent of the microbiome. And, you know, if you think salmonella is bad, which, you know, which is a deadly intestinal infection, that only knocks out about 15 percent of the gut. Cipro can do half of it. Uh, so we're now three generations into the discovery of pesticides, chemical food additives, antibiotics. And with each generation, mothers have less and less microbiome to pass on to their kids. And we're at the point now where we're witnessing the collapse of so many keystone species of people's microbiomes, that chronic disease is becoming the norm, not the exception. So, all right, how do you know if you have a bad microbiome? If you can do a $500 uh, stool test, that's fantastic. You know, um, if you can't, I'm going to show you, tell you four things you can do really easy to tell. Um, and so, and surprisingly, gut issues are not the primary sign that you've got a bad microbiome and we'll talk really? about that yeah Interesting. yeah huh. very counterintuitive that way um so the first question is does your stool smell bad a healthy microbiome creates stool that has almost no smell i mean a little acidic from the short chain fatty acids that's about it the second one is do you need toilet paper okay a healthy microbiome means you wipe once and there's nothing on the toilet paper hmm. and i know that sounds impossible to some people i'm telling you that's that's the case right um like if you were um, going to go buy a horse 
or a mule or something in the old days, you know, you'd look at its teeth, right, to see how old it is because the teeth, the gum line recedes. And then you lift up the tail and you look at the backside. And it's, if there's poop all over its backside, if it's soiling itself, that animal's sick. It's got a sick microbiome. You don't want an animal with four stomachs to have a bad microbiome. It's not going to be well, right? Yeah. So if, if an animal, human or otherwise, soils itself, meaning it needs toilet paper, the microbiome is totally out of whack. Another one is yeah. transit time. How long does it take to go from eating it to having, when it goes down into the toilet? And it should take about 18 hours. And you can yeah. test that with uh, two tablespoons of organic blueberry extract and eat that with some fruit and see how long it takes for your poop to turn dark blue. Um, now, some people will say, oh, well, I go to the bathroom every day. I'm not constipated. Well, okay. But if what went in is something you ate four days ago, then that's a problem. And if you look at the space between your belly button and your pubic bone and you see a pooch there, you know, that's very likely um, a lot of old food that's just slowly working through. And we're going to talk about how to fix that. Huh. And then the last thing you can do is you can go get some pH paper. I think I got some over here. And, you know, you just... Uh, you go get some pH paper, and you want to get the pH paper that goes in a range from 6 to 8. If it goes from 4 to 10, it sets a wide range. You're not going to be able to see the color chart exactly where you are. And you want your health, your, a healthy stool is going to be 6.6. .6. Um, now, you can have a 6.6 .6 on your stool and still it, have it be wrecked in other ways. But if it's not 6.6, .6, if it's 7 and up or 6.2 and down, there's definitely a problem. Uh, and, you know, if you're like 99% of the population, your microbiome is probably out of whack to some degree. So then the next question is, okay, how do we recover it? And you'd think probiotics, right? That's what everybody says. I have, you know, I have yogurt every day. I'm fine. I'm like, okay, so let's, let's go over the history of this. Um, the first probiotics we learned to make were, uh, contained the, the bacteria lactobacillus and bifidus, which is the baby gut, right? And we use those to turn crushed vegetables and milk into sauerkraut and yogurt. And they're, they have a use, and we can get into that. Um, but again, this is the wrong bacteria for an adult. These two represent only 0.01% of the adult gut microbiome. The other 99.99% aren't those. So taking probiotics is not going to, um, at least at the moment, not going to help us out. Now, we are, the problem is those, we choose those two because they're easy to grow, right? They are somewhat oxygen tolerant, and you can scale up a lab to make these things in giant vats. The bacteria that is actually in the gut, not only are there thousands of them, but they don't grow very well in a lab. Now, we're, we're finally getting to the point where we're learning how to make industrial-sized uh, intestine simulators to grow the bacteria we actually need, but we're still several years away. And until then, we need to know where we get the good bacteria that aren't being made yet. And now you have three reserves. The first are dormant cells, meaning the, these are good cell, good bacteria in your microbiome, assuming your mother had them to give them to you, that go to sleep because there just aren't enough oligosaccharides in the diet. There's enough to keep them barely metabolically active, but they're basically hibernating, waiting for better times. So easy, easy fix, right? You take the oligosaccharides back in the diet, they bloom, um, and you're good to go. Now, uh, the second reserve is the appendix. I know we've been told the appendix is a vestigial organ, cut it out, no big deal. No, it actually has an antiseptic or antibiotic effect where it keeps um, infections from, or bacteria from going from the large intestine up to the small, and it also has a backup copy of your microbiome. So if someone were to go get, say, salmonella and terrible diarrhea and, and flush out their microbiome or 15%, when it's done, the, my, the appendix can get a little squirt and reseed it, mm -hmm. unless the person's taken something like Cipro and wiped the... Uh, the bacteria out of the, uh, the appendix. Now, the third reserve is the environment and every person you meet, every hand you shake, every breath, you know, every salad you eat, every bit of air you breathe in, everywhere you go, microbiome is in the air and you could say it's disgusting, yeah, but life finds a way. So it's there. Um, you, so as, as, long, if you, as long as there's some oligosaccharides in your diet, it's kind of unusual unless someone's taken the heavy duty antibiotics for all, you know, for all the keystone species to die. Uh, basically, they're, they're most likely there. They're probably just dormant. And if you consider that a single surviving bacteria with a doubling time of 20 minutes, in 12 hours, it's 34 billion, right? So it doesn't take long to, after refeeding the microbiome for it to repopulate. All right. So not probiotics, although there is a place for them oligosaccharides. All right. So the next question is, can you get them a diet like our early ancestors? Maybe, but 
okay, one, it would take excellent digestion to get the oligosaccharides from the food. Take in, inulin, for example. Yes, it's found in chicory root, sold as a source of fructo oligosaccharides. But if you can't digest it, you're not going to get the fructo oligosaccharides out of it. It's just going to make a gassy nightmare. <laughs> uh, the second thing is you'd have to eat a lot of foods you're probably not accustomed to. You'd be chewing on, on tubers all day long, and the raffinose content of those would be another gut monstrosity. Uh, and then lots of insects and seaweed. And, you know, these are, you know, I don't think most people really want to eat a primitive diet. Um, you'd also be, you'd be chewing tubers two hours a day. Uh, so when I realized I didn't want to do this with diet, I decided to make a mix. Oh, here it is. I decided to make a mix of the eight key oligosaccharides that I decided I wanted and needed for a healthy biome. And I put them in this mix and I put them in the ratio that based on what I could tell from primitive diets would be something that you would approximate what you'd get if you were eating primitively. Uh, you don't want to be eating just a whole bunch of one oligosaccharide that's going to throw your entire microbiome uh, in, in out of whack. And it's, you, you really need to get the mix correct. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what the, the ingredients are. So if you want, you can make it yourself. And because they are oligosaccharides or sugars, it actually tastes good. It's sweet. So you can yeah. put it on food. It's, it's, yeah, you, you've tried it. Yeah. So let me tell you these, um, and then, you know, I'll ask you, you know, what your experience with it was. Yeah, so um, the panaceum contains galacto-oligosaccharides, which are what are found in tubers, right? Xylo-oligosaccharides, pectin-oligosaccharides, and fructo-oligosaccharides, which are found in um, fruits and vegetables. Connective tissue oligosaccharides, which are found in wild game. Yes, they're in meat, but it's in the, the tough meat, like the brisket or you know, the deer that you, you hunt in the mountains because their, their, their muscles are very fibrous. You know, mm -hmm. the factory meat, you know, this, this really expensive Kobe beef that's massaged and fed milk and beer and never allowed to move, there's no connective tissue in it, right? Um, chitin oligosaccharides, which are found in insects and mushrooms, phacoidin oligosaccharides found in seaweed, and isomalto oligosaccharides found in honey, miso, and kimchi. Uh, Panaceum has got about 200 times more uh, galacto-oligosaccharides than you'd find in beans and 300 times more you'd find in Brussels sprouts. So, you know, you are basically, be you are becoming the world's most successful hunter-gatherer, you know, uh, uh, very easily without hours of hiking around. And, and it's a quarter uh, teaspoon a serving. I yeah, mean, it it's doesn't very take little. much. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, you know, the microbiome, <laughs> the microbiome is so much for you. It's like, just, just feed me this much, just, just a little, <laughs> feed me a little and I will do everything for you. Right. It's <laughs> okay. So one question is why do we have to have so many different oligosaccharides? Can I just do like one or two of these things? All right. So first oligosaccharides, they act as decoy molecules. And what that means is um, pathogenic bacteria and fungi want to attach to your gut wall and hang out there and cause trouble, but they'll attach to the oligosaccharides that said, and then out they go. So the more varied oligosaccharides you have in your diet, the more varied types of pathogenic bacteria and fungi you can uh, show the door. Okay. The second is different bacteria that you do want have different food source requirements. So the greater diversity of oligosaccharides you have, the greater diversity of species in your microbiome, and you want a diverse microbiome. And we're going to get into this with a carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. You want that thousand fold genetic database to do all sorts of things for you. You know, someone could, um, someone could come along and say, oh, I did a, a genetic test. I don't methylate. Your gut can methylate. Oh, well, I, I can't handle histamine. I don't have the DAO enzyme. Your gut has that. Oh, I, I'm B12 deficient. Your gut makes B12, all right? All these things that we think are genetic flaws. Yeah, but you've got a thousand times more genetic capacity in your gut than you do have in your own body. So, you know, it's not, don't freak out if you've done a 23andMe test and found that you don't make methyl, you don't methylate. No problem. Really, your gut will make folate for you and in just the right amounts if you have a good microbiome. Okay. The third reason we have so many oligosaccharides is they're not interchangeable. And let me tell you a story. Um, based on, this is, this is actually the story, this is, the, this is the, the origin story of this product, right? Very dear friend, she's in her 20s, and she's two years into a, a serious and worsening health crisis. I mean, you know, catastrophic chronic fatigue and brain fog. You wouldn't be able to hold down a job, can barely move, catatonic on the ground sometimes, uh, and, and in her 20s, this, this poor girl, right? And so I did one of these symptom questionnaires. Have you ever seen any of these things? They're like six, you know, six pages of every symptom you could possibly imagine. And then you, you grade it, and it'll tell you what organ systems are having the most symptoms. Great yeah. thing to do. Okay. 
every every organ system was in almost total collapse on this poor girl. I'm like, oh my God, you know, I, I, I've never seen this before. I, I, you know, I, I had no idea what to do. And she was moving towards needing full-time live-in care. So, all right. So I picked the top one. I said, okay. Um, her top issue was cardiac. And I'm like, okay, chronic fatigue, cardiac. Maybe she's got something going on with her ventricles, prolapse. You know, maybe she's got a mitral valve prolapse. Maybe she's got some heart damage. I don't know what's going on. Take it, you know, send her to a top cardiologist. Her heart is in perfect condition. Hmm. The only thing they say is, well, there is a lot of inflammation. I'm like, okay, inflammation, write that down. Okay, so go to the next one on the list, um, uh, neurologic. So we uh, do a blood test and check all our neurotransmitters. Her neurotransmitters were wrecked. They were either completely crashed or totally spiked. There was nothing anywhere in the middle. And what do you do with someone like that? So I tried, you know, giving her various supplements to try to bring the high ones down, the low ones up. And it just, it just threw everything out of whack. It, it couldn't be managed, right? It, it wasn't, I, you could not ma micromanage her, her neurotransmitters. So I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, and I'm going down the list. And finally, it says gut. I'm like, well, gosh, it's obviously not her gut. It's like all the way down the list. But maybe I can give the poor girl some like a 10% benefit, right? Just get her a little bit better. And so did a stool test. And lo and behold, her gut was wrecked. Hmm. Wow. Because she wasn't presenting with a lot of gut issues, right? That's the thing. It don't say it. You won't think it's gut. Okay, sometimes. And what happened is, you know, we, uh, she had taken a long course of antibiotics for recurrent kidney infections as a kid. She would wipe, wiped out her microbiome. And hmm. remember, the microbiome is the regulatory capacity of the body. So this explains her inability to regulate her neurotransmitters. She couldn't also regulate her body temperature. She would never sweat when it got warm, although she sweats now. Nice story. All right, anyway. So that explained her our neurotransmitters, her fatigue, her inflammation from lipopolysaccharides. And so I said, okay, well, um, what do I do? And I found out that you don't do probiotics because she's probably already got the bacteria in her. They're just dormant. Hmm. So what I did is I made a mix of every oligosaccharide I could think of in the ratio I thought would work. And I gave it to her. Three days later, she was 80% better, which, wow. you know, from someone who was basically in tears that they would never have a life, that was amazing. Yeah. And so that was great. But then, okay, um, I ran out of two of the oligosaccharides. And with, over the course of three days, she completely regressed. She was back to catatonia, back to unable, unable to move. And I'm like, all right, um, I think it might be this one. So I, I got her those oligosaccharides, gave them back to her again. And in two hours, she was, um, wasn't bedridden anymore. She made herself lunch. And over the next four days, she got back again. So what are the takeaways from this, right? One, oligos oligosaccharides are not interchangeable. You know, um, she was getting six of the eight and missed two, and that was enough to completely knock her back. And the second is, if you have the right materials to work with, if you have the oligosaccharides, you can regain your health faster than you lose it. She recovered in four days, which took her two years to lose. And then the other thing is like, well, now I've got to make it as a product. So I was just making it for her, right? I've got to make because how many people are like her, right? So that's the origin story of, of uh, Panaceum. And actually, you know, most of my products, or a lot of them, basically have an origin story of somebody I cared for was sick. How do I help them? And then, oh, I should make this available. That's amazing. And, and, and it wasn't just that. Did you try just giving her the two? Or did it uh, No, I was not going to. I, I, I was never going to put her through that misery of, of, yeah. again. I'm like, okay, we know, eight, we know the eight work. You know, if I give you the two and then, though, and then you're, but that, so, and you know, what am I going to do? Try, try to, you know, people, you know, there's an idea of a magic bullet approach. I'm, I'm much more in favor of the enchanted shotgun. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, I don't care realistically. Maybe one, maybe she only needed those two. It doesn't matter. It's not worth trying to figure out because somebody else might need a different two. I, I don't know. Uh, so I'm going to give them everyone. I'm going to give you every oligosaccharide you could possibly come in into contact with as the most successful hunter gatherer of all time. And in the ratio I think is appropriate and your gut will figure it out. Is, is this, um, from a, from a caloric standpoint mm. and spiking sugars, you know, there's people who are afraid mm. of their, they have glucose monitors and they're doing right. this and they've heard, Oh my gosh, you know, what effect does the panaceum have? On it's, that uh, okay. Oligosaccharides will have a regulating effect on blood sugar. Number one, you can't digest them. So you can't get any energy out of them. They're a okay. sugar that does nothing for your, to your blood sugar, right? Mm. However, your blood sugar is regulated, not by your pancreas primarily, it's regulated primarily by your microbiome that tells the pancreas what to do, right? It's the one behind the scenes running the whole show. 
So when your microbiome is healthy, your blood sugar will, should normalize because it's, getting, it's better able to, to, to regulate that. And actually, um, you, you're actually going to get access to about 10% more energy because you're now, uh, the microbiome is able to burn those sugars in a way that's slow, and then you get the caloric energy out of that. So not only will you have more energy, but it'll be more stable. So if anyone's doing it, and, and maybe you have an opinion, I'm sure you do, on, on some, like intermittent fasting, okay. uh, does okay. it break a fast or no? I'm a purist, right? I do 14-day water fast once a year, and I believe when you do a fast, you just do water. Got it. Having said that, I would want my microbiome healthy before I did a fast, mm -hmm. and I would consider possibly taking it rectally during a fast under certain conditions. I, I'd, have to, I'd have to kind of think about that a little bit. But uh, let, let's get to those. Let's get to those points, and we'll yeah. kind of understand it from a, a, a larger perspective. So, I want to give your your listeners eight secrets to mm. the healthy microbiome. Right? Okay. So, the first secret is consume a wide variety of oligosaccharides at the right ratio. That's it. Just 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 feed it. If you do nothing else but feed it, you are you're going to get the most amazing human upgrade you, over time you can imagine. Okay. Now let's talk about the next one. What about fiber? Okay, so humans are estimated to have been here for about 200,000 years in our current form. 190,000 years, we were hunter-gatherers. Uh, 10,000 years, we were farmers. And the last 100 years, were modern men and women. Hunter-gatherers were eating about 100 grams of fiber a day. Early farmers, about 35, and modern man, about 15. And, uh, you know, with lower levels of fiber, the risk of mortality goes up significantly. So, you know, you want to eat a certain amount of fiber. The question is how much? Uh, eating the amount of fiber that the uh, hunter-gatherers did, it's not realistic. You know, uh, I'm not going to chew on tubers all day long. Um, but the modern diet's fiber deficient. So I aim at 35 grams of fiber a day like we did for 10,000 years at the dawn of agriculture. Um, you know, considering that 35 grams of fiber worked for the last 500 generations of humans, I'd say it's proven itself to be a functional dietary uh, protocol. Now, how do you get to 35 grams of fiber? Now, some people will say, I eat a lot of salad. Kurt, how many grams of fiber do you think are in a cup of shredded carrots? Oh my gosh, I have no idea. Five? Yeah, three, almost <laughs> none, right? We think there's all this fiber in it. Actually, not so much, right? So if you're only gonna get <laughs> three grams from a cup of carrots, how, how are you ever gonna get to 35 grams a day? And the answer is beans. Yes. Mm -hmm. Beans are the first crop ever cultivated before grains, and I think they're the best ones. They give us 17 grams of fiber, depending on the bean, uh, for a cup of, um, per cup. And the rest, you, that's half of your dietary fiber intake. The rest you can do with grains and fruits and vegetables. Now, some people say, oh, I can't do beans. They give me gas. Well, first off, um, soak the beans twice. Soak them, rinse them, soak them, rinse them. Do that for a day and then cook them. That will make a huge difference, much more than taking bean oil. Uh, that enzyme. I don't. And then the other one is um, try adzuki beans. They are the least of they are the, they are the least musical bean. <laughs> I can put it that way. Um, and so, uh, if you're going to get past 35 grams of fiber a day, a day you're probably going to have to take a fiber supplement, which I would not do. Okay. Uh, insoluble fiber irritates a an irritated, damaged gut, and soluble fiber creates methane gas, which, aside from flatulence, is a paralytic agent and it paralyzes the intestines. Mm. And I'll talk to, talk to you a little bit about uh, how to deal with methane production. Um, all right, I'll tell you right now, I'll give you a bonus. If you've got methane production, um, there's a bug in your, it's not even a bacteria, it's, an, uh, it's, a, it's an earlier than bacteria. Uh, it's in the archaea group. Fine, call it a bacteria. And they're methanogens, they make methane. And the methane not only makes gas, uh, but it also paralyzes the intestine. And if you, Take uh, a quarter a teaspoon of uh, food grade Epsom salts a couple of times a day in a glass of water that will shunt away from the methanogenic bacteria into the acetate producing bacteria because sulfate will shift uh, the metabolic processes. Um, you know, methanogens are like weeds. Uh, they're very easy to outcompete as long as the, there's proper fertilization. So in this case, the fertilization is sulfate, which most of us are uh, insufficient in. So uh, you um, actually have been doing uh, the beans for a little while. What's your experience been? Yeah. I mean, I hadn't had beans in 13 years, mm. you know, because of gas and just because of inflammation and, oh, I read, oh, inflammation, you know. So I got organic kazuki beans, mm -hmm. uh, natural grocers here, soaked them for 24 hours, mm -hmm. uh, brought them to a boil, cooked them and really no issues at all. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I noticed if I eat them at night versus the morning, I have a little bit more of a problem and maybe it's what I'm eating them with. But it also, the interesting thing is it adds, because I've been mostly carnivore, so meat and eggs, you know, mm-hmm. it adds some bulk. And what I have to be careful of is I'm so used to eating so much mm-hmm. because meat and eggs don't fill me up mm-hmm. that I don't need that much anymore mm-hmm. because the beans really add bulk. Like mm-hmm. I feel bulk, not in a bad way, but I just feel some bulk there from eating it that I haven't felt in a long time. So Yeah. Yeah. And well, it's important because that physical bulk you're feeling is creating hormones in the gut that are then regulating the body, right? So you need that feeling in order to secrete certain hormones in order to run your whole system. But let's talk about why you, you might've been getting some gas. How late in the, how late at night were you eating? Uh, yesterday I ate about, I eat pretty early. I ate about 5 PM. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I had breakfast. Usually I'll eat breakfast around six or seven. And then I don't eat lunch. I'm just not hungry. Mm-hmm. And usually I'll, then I'll eat around five or six. In the mm-hmm. middle of the day, I'll have my I'll have my panacea and some water, you know, and things like that. And maybe I'll have something, a little snack mm-hmm. to kind of have okay. it with it. So you weren't eating late at night. You weren't like eating at eight no, o'clock. No, no. Okay, so let's talk about transit time because that's really where the next question is. So we're getting on to the, the third. The first secret is the oligosaccharides. The second secret is beans. The third secret is transit time. Mm. That's how long it takes from point A to point B, right? And depending on the kind of food we eat, uh, it's one to four hours in the stomach, about six hours in the small intestine, and 10 hours-ish in the large intestine. Now, if you have a transit time less than 16 hours, you're not get, your gut doesn't have enough time to absorb things, and that's a malnutrition, mm. right? But much more likely is transit time is longer than normal. You can have transit times of two, three, four, five days. And these people will say, I'm not constipated. I go to the bathroom every day. Yeah, but it's from five days ago, right? And so what will happen is, you know, some people... If you if it takes more than 18 hours, you start getting putrefaction and fermentation. And I'll explain why that happens. Um, now, some people will. So, how do you fix a transit time? Well, first off, don't take things like cascara sagrada because these are stimulants that you get used to, and then now you have to take them to have a normal transit time. And then if you stop them, you have a really low transit time. It's a drug. It's the drug addiction model. So not, that's mm. not the way. But there are a few things now. Uh, consider the Hadza of Tanzania, right? Again, they eat 100 grams of fiber a day, but here's the key. They do 135 minutes of vigorous exercise a day. That comes to, and here's the magic number, 1.35 minutes of exercise for every gram of fiber you eat. Hmm. So, hang on a minute. There we go. That means if you're eating standard diet of 15 grams of fiber, you have to eat, you have to hike 20 minutes a day or do a 30-minute walk. But, if you were going to, going to eat 35 grams of fiber, which is what I'm suggesting you do, that's an hour walk a day. And consider that intestinal transit and peristalsis is a very muscular activity. This is one of the reasons why exercise speeds up transit time. If you have weak muscles in your body, you're also going to have weak muscles in your intestines, and it's not going to move the food at an appropriate speed. Hmm. Um, so the third secret is taking walks. Um, and I'm going to add something to that. Um, what are the main cancers of men and women? There's th- what would you say the three main cancers are? Uh, would it be prostate, prostate and breast? Prostate and breast for men and women. And how about for both of them together? There's one other that they both get. Colon? Boom. Okay, so walking. All right, so for women, it's wearing bras, right? The wire bras are knocking out the circulation, plus the underarm de- the, and locking up their lymphatics and their underarms with that nasty crystals, so, aluminum salts, and God knows what are they toxins, and they stick right into their breast. For men, and and for men and women, it's sitting. When you sit down, you jam up the prostate, and blood flow cannot get to it properly. This is one of the reasons I think men get so much prostate. So the only time I ever sit down is like right now when I'm sitting down for a podcast. Otherwise, I'm standing up at my desk, and I might maybe when I'm eating. Other than that, you will never see me in a chair because you want the flow. You don't want to pinch off the blood flow of your prostate. But also, when you're walking, the motion of the walking is flushing the prostate back and forth. Now the same thing with sitting also kinks up the colon. Now there's not a lot of blood flow in the colon at certain points. So what are we really seeing? I think that sitting is causing or accentuating and increasing the risk of both prostate cancer in men and colon cancer in men and women. And when you walk, not only are you, you're flushing blood through that area. So, you know, third secret is taking walks, right? Go out for a walk. Um, and now you've heard don't eat at night, you know, Grandma always said, you know, oh, it's too late, don't eat. And I'm going to explain why. There's a special kind of uh, peristalsis called um, the migrating motor complex is the common name for it. 
And it's how the gut cleans itself of leftover debris, right? There's all these different kinds of peristalsis. There's one that moves it forward a little bit. There's one that moves it forward, but leaves a little bit of hole in there. So some goes forward and some comes back It mixes it. There's some that kind of squeeze like this and they're going back and forth. And then there's one that just goes straight from the top to the bottom. It just goes all the way down the giant, the migrating motor complex and flushes it all clean. And we need this because if you end up with food just hanging out in your small intestine because it never gets flushed, then you're going to end up with SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, which we can talk mm -hmm. about in a minute. So um, the small intestine will not go through this cleansing flush if there's food in the stomach of the small intestine. That means if, so what you want is you want to have dinner start or dinner end, dinner start 14, 14 hours between dinner and breakfast, right? That yeah. way, if, let's say you, if you have four hours in the stomach and eight, you know, uh, six hours in the small intestine, you still have a couple of hours now for the gut to clean itself every night. So really important, don't snack after dinner, have your dinner. If you, you know, when, if you're going to have your dinner at, at, uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you eat at eight o'clock at night, then stomach's in the food for four hours, that's 12, six more hours at six in the morning. And if you wake up at six o'clock with a blaring alarm clock, turning on your sympathetic nervous system, you know, you never get your gut cleaned out. So again, 14 hours between breakfast and dinner. I'm sorry, between dinner and breakfast. That's a, a key one. And no, so no snacking. So the fourth secret, 14 hours between dinner and breakfast and no nighttime snacks after dinner. Hmm. Now, another thing people will say is like, well, what about digestion? Um, it's really important that only fiber and oligosaccharides enter the large intestine. Let me say it again, because it's a key thing. It's important that only fiber and oligosaccharides re enter the large intestine. Everything else should be digested and absorbed in the small intestine. Now, when we eat beyond our capacity to digest and absorb, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats end up in the large intestine and they cause problems. Mm -hmm. Proteins and fats in the large intestine stimulate the growth of a putrefying form of clostridia, which is the same form of bacteria that digests corpses and are but the corpses smell so god awful if you ever go to an autopsy. Wow. Um, carbohydrates, other than oligosaccharides and fiber in the large intestine, ferment and create gas, alcohol, and formaldehydes and feed candida. So you want to eat enough of each of these major groups and nourish yourself, but not so much that you get spill over into the large intestine and create putrefaction and dysbiosis. And this is, and I'm not saying, hey, you can't, you know, go and, and go to a birthday party and pig out on on on, you know cake or go to barbecue and just have all the ribs you can possibly eat. You can do that. A couple of caveats. One, um, make sure that that evening, you know, you get a fair amount of time to flesh it all out. Um, and two, uh, yeah, make sure your transit time is functional. That way, mm -hmm. yeah, you've got it. You know, you, you broke the rules, but whatever, you know, life is, you know, you want to enjoy life. You don't want to, you know, have not be able to break any rules. The idea is to be so healthy that you can break the rules once in a while, but to know what the rules are and then know how to, to, to kind of, um, kind of cheat. So I'm going to tell you how to cheat. Right. Um, so, so the fifth secret is don't eat more than your capacity. Right. But then you've got some people that, uh, they don't even digest small amounts of food, you know? So now what do they do? Because even if they eat a little bit of food every day, uh, uh, you know, at each meal, they still can't even digest that. So there's three hacks. One, chew your food. Well, if you don't have a good bite alignment, go to a dentist. Two, make sure your bile is flowing because if not, it's going to throw off your fat digestion, gives the pancreas alkali burns. And uh, we have a product on our website called Glitamins in the orange box. You can look at that. And the third is take digestive enzymes with your meals, which is the trick, right? Um, that way, uh, if, either if you're going to take an enormous meal, take a bunch of digestive enzymes with it so it doesn't get to the colon undigested and cause putrefaction. Or if you just have digestive issues, even with small meals, not a problem. There are plant and animal-based um, enzymes you can take, and I take them every day with each meal because as you age, you kind of run out of your metabolic um, allotment of enzymes, and I don't want to run out of it early. Hmm. So, um, you know, if you have gas that smells bad, so if a person has gas, they're probably uh, fermenting in their large intestine from excess sugars that made it to it. And if their body, if their breath or their body smells bad anywhere in their body, then they probably have uh, protein that's uh, putrefying in the gut. And if they have gas that smells bad, then they've got the, they've got the trifecta. They've got proteins and fats and carbohydrates. They're all, you know, getting funky in the large intestine. And so now you know how to deal with that. So the sixth secret is digestive enzymes. looks like you got, you got, a, you, got a, you have something you want to add. No, no, I just, it, it, it's all very fascinating. And, uh, the, 
how do you know, how can you tell? Cause some people just literally can't tell, I guess eat slower, but, but if once you've gone beyond your capacity, because some people eat so quickly, right. And maybe that's the secret before they, when they, they hit their capacity three minutes ago, but they don't know it because they've just, they're eating so fast. What's a good kind of clue that, okay, I'm at capacity. I'm going to stop. Well, yeah, absolutely. So that, those are the four things I said, you know, when you look at your stool, I mean, you could look and you could actually see undigested fibers in there. Uh, you toilet paper, toilet paper and pH, you know, if you need toilet paper, your gut's not right. And hmm. this could be one of the reasons. Got it. Okay. Secret number six, uh, digestive enzymes. Now let's get to number seven. There are two prebiotics that aren't in the panaceum formula, and that's because they're easy to make, they're cheap, and they'd be required in such large amounts that I wouldn't have any room in the jar. So I'm mm -hmm. going to tell you how to make them yourself. These are retrograde or resistant starches and beta-glucans. Now, a, a retrograde starch or resistant starch is what happens when you take a starch, a starchy food like grain or beans or potatoes or rice, and then you put them in the fridge for four hours, and it causes the starch to crystallize and takes a different form. It turns it into a time-release oligosaccharide. So if you do have blood sugar issues, but you still want to be able to enjoy, hey, you know what? Sushi, you could say, if you, if you do it yourself, meaning you haven't added sugar to the rice and you just do white rice and fish or brown rice and fish, you could say, quote unquote, that's paleo, because even though it's a starch, because you, fr you put it in the fridge, you've changed it from a starch to a retrograde starch. You're not mm -hmm. going to get the same blood sugar crash. So um, beta-glucan is the prebiotic, is, uh, also works with the immune system. It's a prebiotic and you find it in very high amounts, in oats. So if you want these two prebiotics I'm referring to, all you have to do is cook organic whole grain oats and stick them in a the fridge for four hours. Uh, I kind of go a little past that. I actually cook the oats, blend them up with panaceum and some probiotics, and then I cook them or I, I ferment them for two days to get the bacteria, and then I stick them in the fridge. So I've got like, I've got the beta-glucan, the retrograde starch, and I've made a probiotic, which is really what I'm you know, dialed in. But secret number seven, chilled oatmeal. Hmm. And then the final secret is a good attitude, right? So the microbiome is going to affect your mood. Um, the microbiome produces, consumes, and regulates neurochemicals that create our emotions. Uh, but our emotions also stimulate the growth of various bacteria. So like fear and anger and stress, which would be adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol respectively, stimulate the growth of pathologic bacteria and can turn good bacteria bad. On the other hand, oxytocin, which is the neurotransmitter released to the feelings of love and compassion and puppies and little babies, you know, that supports the growth of good bacteria and good bacteria makes oxytocin, right? So it's, it's either a vicious or a virtuous cycle. Depends which one you want to do. Uh, and so let's go with the virtuous cycle. You know, have a, the better mood you have, the better bacteria you create, create that make it easier to have a better mood. So... Let me tell you what happened to me, right? I told you the, the origin story. So I was, that was patient zero, all right? I'm, no, I'm patient number one, uh, the second patient. So I started taking it. I'm like, wow, it's really helping her. Uh, I feel like I'm in pretty good shape, but let, let's see. Um, and so over the course of a month, this is what happened. My eyesight got better. That was the first thing I noticed. Uh, like all of a sudden, I need heavy glasses in, in when I'm reading. And, you know, the eyes have a very fine blood, blood supply. They're tiny blood vessels. So when the blood vessels start to get damaged, you see it in the eyes first. They have tiny blood vessels, tiny nerves. It's sort of like you're a canary in the coal mine. So mm. eyesight got better, which was nice. Um, the next thing is, you know, uh, my physical strength improved. So, you know, in my, in my garage, I've got a gym set up. And so I was in there and I was um, doing bench. And all of a sudden I'm like, God, did someone lower the, lower the weights? I'm like, no, that's, that's still the same number of weights. Why, am I able, why is it so much easier? And so I had to, I, I had to lay, put more weights on. And not only did my strength increase, but my endurance increased. And I'm not the kind of body type that puts on muscle easily. I, I plateaued. I got it, you know, as strong as I was going to get based on the amount of work I was doing. I got an upgrade, right? I got stronger. My, biome, my microbiome said, hey, would you like another 10, 15% of strength? I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so physical strength and endurance went up. My sense of balance improved. Now, here's an interesting one. I was a mid forceps delivery, which meant I was coming in paratrooper, coming in feet first. Doctor went in with some forceps, grabbed my head, twisted me, pulled me out, and my head was like, the, like, a, like an eggplant by the time I came out. Huge brain damage, right? And I have never had good balance. I could never mm -hmm. dance well. I could never lift one foot up and take a shoe off and on my whole life, right? My balance is great now. I can lift a foot up, take a shoe off, 
put it back on, stand up. And I can dance now, which is fantastic because I love dancing and I was always terrible at it. And now I like a dancer on the house and it's great and it's fun and I'm not falling over all the time. So I've got, you know, I'm 53. I've got a lot of dancing to make up for. So, you know, having, but, but the interesting thing is it's not, this wasn't a recent bit of damage. This is something, this is damage from 53 years ago. So my microbiome was able to fix damage I had that was 53 years old. So that I think is amazing. Uh, and the next thing is my skin got really resistant to scrapes and cuts. So, you know, I work off grid on a farm. Uh, I live off grid on a farm and, you know, you're always cutting your hands, you know, you know, barbed wire, weed pulling, whatever. And uh, I was walking barefoot the other day uh, when the story happened and I caught my foot in a door and I ripped the Achilles tendon and the top of my foot up. And I'm like, oh my God, I, I can't believe I did this. Why did I wear shoes? And I get, you know, I get back home and I'm looking at it thinking I'm going to have to rinse it out. I might need to have stitches. I don't know. And I look at it. There's no blood. I'm like, oh, that's it. I look closer. I'm like, the skin isn't even scraped. It was red. That was it. And that redness was gone the next day. That, that injury would have torn me up into pieces a month ago. And so my skin got stronger. And Kurt, that's when it, 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 it dawned on me. I figured it out. Do you know what all these things have in common? Eyesight, physical strength, endurance, balance, and skin. No. These are all things that get worse with age. Mm. Mm. So yeah. what, in return for feeding my microbiome, the oligosaccharides it was asking for all this time, it, made, it returned the favor and started making me younger. It was upgrading me. And, you know, there's a, there are, are studies where they will take the microbiome of a young mouse or rat and then put it into a transplant and into the, the colon of an old rat or mouse. And what happens to the old rat or mouse? It gets younger. It's fur fills back in again, all the, all the patches of missing fur fill in and it gets, the fur gets darker and shinier. It starts doing mounting behavior, meaning it becomes sexual again. So maybe aging is secondary to the microbiome. Maybe what's really going on is it's not that we're aging, our microbiome is aging. And then when our microbiome ages, we age as a corollary, as a secondary effect to that. That's fascinating. And, you know, it's, I, I, I get acupuncture and I was recently talking to my acupuncturist, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that go on. I mean, you mentioned antibiotics, but there's certainly, I assume a lot of other medications and other things that may come in syringes, right. That, that also have an effect on microbiome. There's a lot of EMFs, things in the world, right. That can affect this and, and we can protest and we can try to stop it. You live off grid, but these things are, they're growing, right? I mean, unless we, we take down every 5G, whatever it is, my acupuncture, he, he said to me, he said, listen, I'm not saying any of those things are bad and trying to stop them, but the key is how about we upgrade ourselves to deal with these things? Yeah, you know, a, a famous um, naturopath once said, you know, if you can't have your client eat a hot dog and a soda and not feel sick, you haven't fixed them. And mm -hmm. obviously this guy was not promoting hot dogs and soda. He was saying, look, you, you've got to, what, 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 what he said, what your acupuncture is saying without, you know, what they're really saying is you need the ability to maintain homeostasis. You need the ability to bounce back from metabolic insults. Mm -hmm. That is the microbiome. I make detox products to detox the liver. Yet the main detox organ I now understand is not the liver. It's the microbiome. The liver only takes over for the stuff the microbiome can't do or for stuff that you get uh, by inhalation. So the microbiome is the main thing, but you know, you once wanted to, you, you asked, uh, you said we should talk about the carnivore diet because, uh, yeah. yeah. so let's, let's talk about that. I understand a lot of your listeners are carnivores and that's awesome. So, you know, people who are, who end up on a carnivore, so there's a lot of extreme diets, right? And that doesn't mean they're bad, but they're extreme. They're, uh, and they're, they're basically diets people will find based on a inability of them, a, a, a problem with their microbiome, right? So if someone cannot digest fat, they'll end up on a low fat diet. Mm -hmm. If someone cannot digest meat, they'll say, oh, meat is toxic and bad. I'm vegan is the way to go. But that's because they lack the ability to digest meat, right? If they cannot digest plant material, they can end up as an, on a carnivore diet because mm -hmm. they lack the capacity, their microbiome lacks the capacity to digest plant matter. And so the, the truth for these people is that they have, found, they have found that it is better to have a limited healthy microbiome than a, a complete diet and a wrecked microbiome. And I wouldn't take that away from them. If you find that when you eat carnivore, you feel better, that's an amazing truth. 
but the next step is let's take you from a limited meat microbiome to a complete omnivore microbiome. So let's talk about why we might want that, right? Mm -hmm. When you are on a meat only diet, uh, there's a couple of issues. One, we don't have 500 generations of meat only diet like we do farmer diet to know what that's going to do long term to the body. Right. We don't even have 20, 30 years of it. It's relatively new. And if you are going to say, well, this is how, you know, animals eat. OK, but if you are a lion in the Serengeti, one of the first things you eat is the intestines of the animal. You're eating the small intestines because you're eating the plant matter. Mm. You're eating the plant matter that the that the, that gazelle was digesting for you. So even the carnivores in nature are eating plants. They're only eating it after it's been predigested for them. Mm. And the second is even the best hunter gatherers in the hunt in the Hadza's they're only successful like every three, every three days on when they're hunting. So yes, they're eating meat, but not every day, not even every other day. They're mostly eating plant matter and then meat afterwards when they have a successful hunt. Again, that doesn't mean a carnivore diet is bad. It just means if we're going to say it's natural uh, based on primitive diets and carnivore animals, well, is that really the case? But, okay, so is it good for us? Well, we don't know long term. We may have issues uh, with what's going on um, with some uh, metabolites that are going to be created. Um, if you overdo your capacity to digest meat, it will putrefy in the large intestine. You're going get, to get metabolites like cadaverine and putrescine and all sorts of really nasty things you don't want in the body that mm -hmm. can cause uh, heart damage chronically 20 years later. So what I would say is, okay, if you're a carnivore, um, the next step up from that would be to say, hey, can we get you to the point where you can eat as an omnivore? And the reason you might want that is, again, if you're only eating one thing and you overrun your capacity to eat that one thing over time, well, what will you do as a carnivore if 20 years down the line, you've so burnt out your protein digestive system that you can't eat meat anymore? Hmm. Now you're really screwed because now you can't eat meat and you can't eat anything, right? So you want to, if you're going to do that, please take some proteolytic enzymes so you don't burn out your meat digestion capacity. But why might you want to add plants to the diet? Well, my thought on the matter is for all the things the microbiome does for us, I want the healthiest microbiome I can get. And the healthiest microbiome is the one with the most amount of genetic diversity. Now, if I'm only eating meat, I'm only eating the one or two oligosaccharides that I'm going to find in connective tissue. There are most of my bacteria in my gut might not be getting the food they need. And those bacteria will therefore not be regulating me. I'm not going to uh, your microbiome makes 500,000 different met metabolites, at least, for, and it represents 40% of the compounds floating in your bloodstream. It is the biggest effect on your body and your mind and your psyche and your emotions and your health. So I want that thing to be, you know, the most amazing microbiome possible. And I don't want to limit my microbiome species diversity by limiting my oligosaccharide intake to just a few things that deal with meat. So... Um, what you could consider is, can we walk you back? You know, yes, I honor the fact that you don't handle plants well. Let's work on getting you to the point where you can be an omnivore so you can have this incredibly robust microbiome so you don't burn out your meat pathways and end up in a, you know, you know painted into a corner. That would be my, my offer. My yeah, suggestion. no, absolutely. I mean, adding the beans has been great. Um, and I'm a little addicted to them now. I, I love the taste of them. Um, you know, fruits, I deal with fruits pretty well. There's some veggies that I've, and, and some of them make no sense as to fitting in certain categories. Like I, I shouldn't handle broccoli well, cause there's certain mm -hmm. things I handle broccoli just fine. Cauliflower, not that great. Um, mm -hmm. so there's certain things that I'll eat that I try to stay away from kale. I try to stay away from some of those things. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, there are certain veggies that I have. If I go to the local juicery in here and I have a veggie juice, I mean, talk about transit time, it's about an hour mm -hmm. or a half hour. Um, so trying to identify some of those things. But, you know, for me, adding the beans was a huge step. And I had to get over the mental, oh my gosh, I'm adding beans. I feel full. I'm getting fat or, or something like that, right? But now it's interesting adding, you know, and thinking about the rice and thinking about some other things to ferment uh, as a next step as well. Mm -hmm. um, but then adding, I mean, I love fruit. I eat fruit. I actually add honey uh, to my diet. Um, Manuka honey, uh, I usually have uh, and, or local honey sometimes. Um, but yeah, I'm all in it. And I think part of it, 
quite honestly, is, is the mental game where I grew up overweight and mm. I had a crap beat out of me and all these things. And, and so doing a lot of subconscious work over the past year, I've noticed that some of the food intolerances I may mm. have created mm. as a way to say, I just can't eat those things. Mm. It was easier for me to say that than mm. discipline or, or something. And so right. now maybe I've messed it up. Now it helped a number of things, right? And I was paleo. So I was eating fruits and vegetables and those things. I think, I think though that my, my microbiome and, and, you know, over the last six months, you know, we, um, I, I, and actually over the last year, I was having some, some gut issues in terms of transit time, but just every, nothing was solid, right? Everything TMI for the listeners. Right. And, you know, looking back every time we went to Europe and we're going to Italy next week and, you know, I kind of self-diagnosed a histamine intolerance, but not all the time. And I, I think maybe it was during allergy season. Like I'd go to Chipotle and I love guacamole. Sometimes the guacamole, I had, I had to run, right? Uh, and sometimes it was fine. But when we went to Europe, I noticed big problems to the point where I, I try to stay off all medications and I had to go get, uh, I forget what it is, basically to stop, to stop yourself up. But then I looked and it's like, well, every plate there that I got had eggplant on it. Mm. And a lot of high histamine foods. So I'm wondering, well, but then there's certain things that should bother me. Like ground beef doesn't bother me at all. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just the microbiome and maybe by building this up, all this stuff won't affect me or it won't. So it, it, are you, um, use your gut better now since you've been doing the, the panacea? Yeah. Over the last two, uh, two, uh, two weeks, you know, it's, so I'm two weeks into it, right? I did three days of the, the clearing phase or the cleaning mm -hmm. phase. And so I'm about two weeks into it. What I've noticed is, cause I'm, you know, I'm 47. Mm -hmm. So there's 47 years plus however long I've been playing with stuff. I notice a massive change for the better, but I also notice I'm not fully in rhythm yet. You know, mm. I mean, things are still kind of, uh, you know, um, but, you know, when my gut is off, I notice my mental game is off and things bother me mm. and I feel it in my gut. It's almost like, <gasps> you know, you crunch for the last two weeks. I haven't felt that. Like, you know, let me tell you a story about that. Cause that, that's, a yeah. thing. and by the way, give you, it usually takes about 21 days for your gut to really kind of organize itself. Um, they did a study of brains and were showing upset faces to people and monitoring their brain activity, right? And then they gave they they gave uh, they improved their gut and showed it to them again. And what they found is that you people would not be so upset by upset faces if their microbiome was healthier. And what this basically means is if you have people that can't say no, these are people pleasers. These are people that can't be in the present. They can't see someone upset at them and handle it. N that is now one of my signs that they they have a, a sick microbiome. Uh, if, if someone has an issue saying no and they have and they have issues with um, boundaries, that's microbiome, which is sort of like this the the um, fractal uh, the fractal version of self versus versus other. Right, the microbiome is there to say this is cool, that's not attack this, let this be. And it's kind of organizing your ability to flow with things and resist things. And it plays out psychologically as the ability to flow with people or resist people and, and have a good psychological state. So indeed, um, you know, I, I'd said that the main thing about the gut microbiome is it doesn't show up as gut. It does show up psychologically. One of the main, what I would say is fatigue or anything psychological. First thought is the gut. Um, to talk a little bit about like fruits and, and vegetables, uh, I do fruits too, but I only do them when I'm going to exercise. Mm. So I'm burning the sugar. So basically what I do is every morning I go out for my 45 minute hike on the mountain and I go and I collect, you know, my strawberries and I, or whatever fruits in, in season off my orchard. And then as I'm hiking, I'm eating fruit. So mm. I'm eating, I'm, I'm burning the sugar as I'm taking it in. Right. And I'm getting my walk in. So I won't do fruit and then sit down. Right. Yeah. If you want, if you want to eat fruit, if you want the sugar, if you want the candy of the natural world, 
Go out for a hike. That's 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 how you earn that's how you earn your fruit. Well, we now, got plenty of that here in Sedona, so that's good. Right. Okay. <laughs> and then in terms of vegetables, yeah, you know, there's plenty of vegetables you shouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole because of the anti-nutrients in them. Mm. And then some of it is just more specific for certain people, right? Like if you have histamine issues, which if you have good gut bacteria, you'll end up with less histamine issues because they will do it for you. Right. Mm. But you know, you might find like for instance, I don't eat foods with high levels of oxalates. Um, yeah. I don't eat foods with high levels of glutamic acids and things like that. I can do it now because my gut microbiome allows me to. If I were to eat food, there are certain foods that if I ate them, you know, it would completely throw certain vegetables, completely knock me out. I can eat them now because my gut microbiome not only can detoxify them, but can then balance what's, what's, what I'm absorbing. Hmm. But, you know, you work your way into it slowly. Not all, not all vegetables are, are friendly for humans. And you have to know which ones to do. Now, the other thing is the fruits and vegetables we've been eating, they're quite different from what they were a thousand years ago, right? We have been um, uh, uh, raising these um, in such a way that we have been selecting for fruit that's very sweet and not bitter. So we're selecting for high sugar and the bitter is where all the medicinals are. So we're, we're making our food less medicinal and sweeter. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is, you know, when you eat food in a, in a, in a supermarket, it's, it's all rotting, right? I mean, you go have a fresh blueberry off a blueberry bush, and then you try eating the one that, that, that you find in the store. The ones in the store, they're good, but they're kind of mealy. You know, they've been sitting around in, a, you know, three days to get to you. Um, they don't have the flavor. They don't have the intensity. And part of what they lose is when fruits and vegetables, when they're harvested, they lose the essential oils, which are the things that the plants use to protect themselves against viruses, fungus, parasites, and bacteria, and cancer, because they have the same issues we do. Right. So when you eat food that's old, that's at a supermarket, that's already a couple of days old. You've lost the, medic the medicine of the essential oils. You've lost the medicine of the bitters because it's been selected out by breeding and you've rake, uh, you're eating something that's very high sugar. So we have another product. That, oh, I got it over here. It's called Zoibin. And what that is, is this nasty mix of essential oils and bitters. Oh, God. that I took that right. That's in the clearing phase. Right. Yeah. And that was. Did I taste, was it like rosemary? There was something that really stuck with me. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things in there. There's yeah. uh, like five different essential oils and, and, and two of the most bitter agents that you can possibly take. Uh, and so, you know, not on, it, it's if you want to be paleo, you need to be adding essential oils and bitters back into your food because that's what some, that's what you would have been eating on a real primitive diet. Uh, and so, right. So our clearing phase, basically what, 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 um, what I suggest is, you know, a couple of days of, um, essential oils and bitters and maybe some elagic acid to, to try to support the body in dealing with the bacteria that sh shouldn't be there. And then before you start growing the stuff that should be, and do we have time to talk about SIBO or no? Yeah. Yeah. I just, I got I have a heart out here in about 12 minutes. Okay. So, you know, SIBO is a, a huge issue and, uh, Basically, let me see if I can find my notes on this. Um, what SIBO is, is uh, it's bacteria growing in the small intestine. Now, you should have most of your bacteria in the large intestine. You should only have like a, you know, a, a one thousandth of what's in the large intestine should be in the small intestine. But a lot of people end up with it in there and it overgrows. And then, you know, they start having dysbiosis and putrefaction in the small intestine. So let me see if I can whip through this one really quick. Or would you want to do this on like a, a slower one on a, on a, on a follow up? Um, yeah, why, why don't we do it now and then we'll have you back. Okay. So, um, there are seven, I'll, I'll just go over, uh, real, real quick and then we can get into depth in another one. Yeah. Um, m I don't think of SIBO as something that some people have and some people don't. It's a continuum. Everybody has some degree of bacterial overgrowth in their small intestines because almost nobody is living a primitive life in a healthy manner. Right. So the question is how much of this do we have? So, the, you know, um, there are seven protections that we get. There's a stomach acid that keep that uh, disinfects the food going into the gut. There's bile, which has a detergent effect on the bacteria um, and triggers the FXR receptors in the ileum. There's the pancreas, which is secreting enzymes. There's the ileocecal valve, which is this valve that's just halfway between that, sort of like the prominence on the front of your pelvic bone to the right and your belly button. And if that area is uh, tender when you, when you rub it in there, or if you got kicked too many times in MMA there, um, <laughs> you could have a problem with your ileocecal valve. Um, we can get into that. Um, so the ileocecal valve is what's supposed to keep the bacteria from your large intestine shooting back up. Uh, and then, um, you've got paralysis of your gut from, 
um, from methane production. Um, there's a lot of things that can end up putting bacteria into your small intestine. And when you have that, you can't take panaceum orally to start because what it'll do is it'll feed the good back, um, oligosaccharides will feed the good bacteria in your large intestine, but they'll also feed the bacteria in your small intestine. And even though if there are good, even though the bacteria might be good in the small intestine, they still don't belong there, right? A good bacteria in the wrong place is still the wrong thing. So if somebody has SIBO, then the protocol is a little bit different. What they have to do is do the clearing protocol, but take the panaceum rectally. They have to get a 35 cc catheter tip syringe, and you can buy those on Amazon, fill it up with the warm, slightly salted water, kind of mild saline, and the panaceum, shake it up, and inject it and lay in your back and kind of roll, roll back and forth, put your feet up, try to get it across the length of your gut. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to regrow the, the microbiome of the, of the large intestine without flaring up the SIBO. And then what you do is you do that for a while, you go on a SIBO protocol, clear out the small intestine, and then you can start taking it orally and mm. the, the kind of SIBO trick. Which, and we can talk about that more at the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Spencer, I want to thank you so much. There, there's so much here. And, and I, I was looking at timings because I'm going to go back at certain times and, and I, I was listening, so I didn't take notes, but there's things, you know, for me that I'm going to do, you know, we have a number of groups, we have men's retreats. Uh, we're going to present all of this to everyone because in two weeks, it's transformed it, me uh, from constantly, honestly, being worried about when I have to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have a gut issue that ha I haven't felt that in about a week and a half. Um, and as I mentioned, just mentally, uh, but also physically, and as I add some of these things, really going to incorporate it for myself, but also share it. We're going to put a link to Remedy Link. We're going to put a link to the protocol in the show notes, everything, the blog post. I'm going to lay out the, you know, we're going to link to all those and definitely want to have you back, uh, you know, after Labor Day. When we get back from Italy, I'll let you know how that went. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll be substituting probably cannellini beans for zuki beans so i'll let you know how that goes but spencer i want to thank you so much for coming on the show today oh thanks so let me leave you with one last thing yeah um we've heard of leaky gut which is created by zonulin and lipopolyposaccharides from um dysbiosis and a bad microbiome but it causes the gut to leak and stuff gets into the body uh, what we'll talk about in the next talk is how if you have a leaky gut which most of us do you've also got a leaky blood brain barrier and basically the fecal matter from the gut is getting out of the, and all those nasty metabolites from putrefaction are getting into the bloodstream and they're crossing the blood brain barrier. So, you know, what you find when you fix the microbiome and you fix the gut is not only do you seal the, the, the leaky gut, you seal the blood brain barrier. The brain, the brain is then able to detoxify itself and, and protect itself. And you just find that your mind is sharper and calmer and less stressful. It's, it's, a, it's a really amazing upgrade. W what I would conclude with saying, Kurt, is that the microbiome is an ancient intelligence with a lineage going back 3.5 billion years. It's, it is a very powerful ally. It's been with you since, guiding you since before you were born. It has so much to offer you. It is the ultimate human upgrade. And all it's asking for is just feed it a little bit of food that it likes. Just feed it some oligosaccharides and it will give you gifts you can't imagine. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm testament to that in just a week and a half, and we're going to keep it up. We'll have you back in September. Spencer, thanks so much for being on the Freedom Media Network. Thanks for having me, Kurt.